Welcome to Vintage SF. I'm Richard Rempel. Today we're going to look at the third book in the Apocrypha of the A Science Fiction Specials Series 1. A Trace of Dreams by Gordon Eklund, 1972. This is a first edition. How do I know? Well, it's the only printing of the book. So does that mean that you're in for a bad read? You can see that there is only eight ratings for this book, and it comes out at 3.25. As well, there is only one review. Stephen Rowland says, an original science fiction novel by an author, who I'd never read before, with a distinct voice. This was a surprise, a nice surprise. So will this be a surprise or a stinker? This is the second novel that I've read by Gordon Eklund. The very last Ace Science Fiction special was The Eclipse of Dawn. Well, let me take away some of the suspense and let you know that A Trace of Dreams is even better than The Eclipse of Dawn. I'll be rating it even higher than it's rated on Goodreads. Now, if you're scratching your head and wondering, hey, I think I know Gordon Eklund. Well, he wrote two early Star Trek novels, The Starless World and Devil World. He also won a Nebula Award for the 1974 novelette that he co-wrote with Gregory Benford, If the Stars Are Gods. He and Benford went on to make that into a novel. So let's take a look at the cover and the description in the blurb. They followed the Dark Star to the ruins of Old Earth. Well, that's half true. Dark Star was the name of James Dark, the rebel leader that we find within this story. The part that doesn't ring true, though, is the ruins of old Earth. This novel doesn't take place on Earth. Earth is only mentioned at the beginning of the novel. And then we have the cover art by Davis Meltzer. We do have a revolution, but the scene that we see on the cover doesn't take place in the novel. It is a kind of fun picture, though, seeing these people raiding the top of a tower. Then we have the blurb on the back of the cover. This was where the game was played. The planet Meridian, a galactic plague spot that could have been a paradise. I'm not sure what they're really talking about saying it's a plague spot. I didn't gather that in the novel. And I'm not sure that this is a game other than there's more to this revolution than meets the eye. These were the players, or this was the cast. A tiny band of outlaws that hid on a seven-mile-high mountain, coming down only to raid the food factories or to establish communication with the queer, half-human greens. And these were the stakes. Freedom, survival, and life itself. The name of the game was Revolution, a strange sort of struggle that was covered by TV like a sporting event and masked a deeper, more complex game than any that had been played before. Well, it does get it right that there's more to this than meets the eye. Why would media corporations embed drone-like little cameras with these rebels or revolutionaries as they raid? Eklund knocks one prediction out of the park, embedding drone-like media cameras with this revolutionary group. So let's get into A Trace of Dreams. To set it up, I'm just going to read from the very first page. This story is one that was told to me and my brother Nathan by grandfather, a story that was so important to the old man that he refused to tell it all to us at once, no matter how much we begged and pleaded, spacing it out instead, telling us a portion each year on our birthday, Nathan and I are twins, and not finishing the whole story for a full ten years, and not even wanting to finish it then, except he'd come to realize that he was going to die, and soon. And if he didn't get the story out and done, he never would. It would die with him and be gone. We were still living on Turksus at this time, me and Nathan, and our mother, and our father, and of course grandfather. He wasn't my grandfather, however, nor was he Nathan's grandfather. What he was, was my mother's father's grandfather, an old, old man who'd spent his life going from one low-gravity planet to another, living it up for well over 200 years, all shrunken up and bald as an egg, with a face hidden beneath black heads and freckles, and a great booming voice that sent shivers rushing through anyone it was aimed at. 
The story took place on a planet called Meridian and happened when he wasn't much older than we were. Meridian was an Earth-type planet that circled an Earth-type star and had 14 moons, 12 of which were artificial and 11 of which were small. He said it wasn't essential to the development of the story to know anything about Meridian, but it always helped to know your facts and have them straight in your mind. Then he pointed his finger up at the sky where three Turks and moons lay floating and smiled and started talking. This is the framework for the story. It's broken apart into the different birthdays of the boys. So their grandfather's name is Matthew. As a young man, he joins this group of rebels out in the hills outside the settlements on Meridian. These rebels are led by a charismatic leader named James Black. We also have a love interest, a companion named Leola. We discover that this rebel group is living outside the community because they don't want to be part of the corporations and their slave-like labor. They make raids on some of the smaller communities. The rebels are mostly young people. When other young people escape the cities and come up to try to join them, they have a process where they interview them. Then there's a vote. More than 50%, you join the group. Less than 50%, you take a walk with them down the hill to a place that is a pile of bones, human bones. If you're not part of the rebel group, you are murdered. In this way, they make sure that they are not found by the corporations. The Earth Corporations or Earth type government is placed into four primary sectors that have a lot of resources. The rest of the planet still has the greens. The greens are treated as less than human. So throughout the grandfather's story, we see the starts of him joining this rebel group, of what happens with this rebel group, and we discover that perhaps there's an uneasy agreement between the government corporations and this rebel group. They allow some raids to occur as long as they don't go too far. Otherwise, they would be hunted down and killed in the mountains using some of the advanced technology. Part of the novel is discovering why this is a good symbiotic relationship, at least for those who rule the planet. Maybe the rebels aren't as idealistic as you think. Slowly, our protagonists start to question their own idealism. Matthew's girlfriend, Loyola, says, I'm caged out here, she said, and they're caged in there. Who's better off? Who would change places with whom? Me with them, or them with me? She shook the fence again. I wish there was someone who could set us all free. The novel turns on this point. We start to learn more about the indigenous people of the planet, the Greens. Do the Greens have a higher power? It's actually quite literal. The higher power is higher up on the mountain. Here we find a cube that reminds me a bit of the obelisk from 2001, but is in a cube shape. There is one door that opens to allow some greens to enter. What is happening on the top of this mountain? We also find out that there's more to these indigenous green people than at first appears, and we actually see an exploration of God and religion. Slowly, over the years, the grandfather tells them more and more. In the beginning, it sounds a little bit more like a fairy tale. But as the boys grow older, the grandfather releases more and more details as they can handle them. It's a wonderful structure to the novel, and it truly takes you to some places you may not expect. Eklund seems to like to explore politics and idealism. We have also some theology thrown in here for good measure. How can you live with the things you've done if you start to doubt your cause? or even your theology. Some big ideas and some paradigm shifts as you learn more about the planet. This was a really fun read. Not a classic, but I would give it 7.5 out of 10. If you're interested in reading it, remember, this is it. The only edition, so you'll have to look in your used bookstore. So, are you aware of any other novels that only have one printing, but are still pretty good novels? Let me know in the comments below. Until next time, keep reading.